want to uh, bring something to your attention before I introduce our presenter tonight. You, as you leave, you can pick up a brochure, and uh, this brochure is about the Fletcher Academy Farm. And some of us know about that farm, it's at Fletcher Academy. You get fresh produce right there. And uh, with, uh, well, talk about produce is good for you. And so look for the brochure as you leave tonight, you'll be back there by the door. Our um, demonstrator tonight is Judith Thomas. At one time we worked together in a church office here, uh, right at the time I was retiring. Uh, Judith is from Sheffield, England. We love her accent. Of course, she would say that we have the accent, I guess, you know. <laughs> and she's happily married to Charles, and they have two grown sons, and they are grandparents. Not her sons, but Judith and Charles are grandparents. Uh, she is an indispensable part of our church life here, as she is the secretary and the treasurer of the Andersonville Seventh day Adventist Church. She is part also of a vibrant monthly program entitled Ask the Doctor, where she asks Dr. Royce Bailey questions and he gives the answer. And that's something that we have grown to just love, look forward to. Judith is going to share some breakfast ideas with you. So uh, we will all love Judith, and I am especially fond of her British accent. How about you guys? Yeah. Hello everyone! I'm looking around at some of your faces and I know there's some old timers here. And for you old timers, I'm making something that I made about four years ago, so some of you will remember it. And uh, it's carrot fudge. And first I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the ingredients. Um, I want to talk about the nuts. Nuts are God's little vitamin pills. Pop a nut, you pop just add it and then you've got lots of vitamins and minerals. Vitamin. And sunflower seeds have the most vitamin E. The most selenium is in Brazil nuts. And Brazil nuts have so much selenium which is good for your brain that you really shouldn't eat more than three or four a day because they're that <laughs> potent. Our nuts have the most Two calcium. People. This little thing here has the most calcium of all nuts. And pumpkin seeds have the most iron. So we're using a number of those nuts today. We're using walnuts, which are a good source of omega-3. There are some omega-6 in here, but it's also a good source of omega-3. And we know the American diet is chock full of omega-6, which isn't good because it causes inflammation when we get too much. So we have to really try to get more omega-3. Uh, the pecans are also, um, and if you look at a walnut, it looks like a brain. But I think the pecan looks a bit like a brain too. So this has some of the same nutrients yes, as sure. the walnuts. And then we're using uh, pumpkin seeds. But what I really want to talk to you about and spend a little time on is about the fates. There's an awful lot of fates when you go to the grocery That's store. Good. There's That's fake good. honey. There's fake maple syrup. And there's a number of other fakes. I'm going to tell you how to spot a fake. I've got the handouts are in your folders. It's called No Refined Sugar Here. Now, person works with a, a gentleman who breeds bees. For the past few years, he hasn't uh, been beekeeping and is thinking of getting back to it. Because when he goes to the farmer's market, he sees some of his old time friends when he used to be beekeeping, and he looks at the honey, he spots that they're cutting the honey. They're cutting it with either half of just corn syrup, or corn sugar, or what's the other thing. But they're, they're watering down the honey to make it go further. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you how you can spot whether your honey at home has been cut with something. And and you know how to do it. There's other ways you can tell once you've bought it. I'm going to talk about ways you can tell before you buy it. Now, when the honey's been on your shelf, it should crystallize. If you've got some honey that you've had in your cupboard for a long time and it hasn't crystallized, then it's been cooked with something else. 
when you go to the store, um, tip the honey upside down. Honey is thick, so that air bubble should move slowly to the bottom once you tip it up. If that bubble goes, it's being cut. Are the cameras working? It's not. It's oh. dead. I was going to say, I was going to ask you to zoom in. Just because the honey bottle says pure, it might not be. But when you turn it upside down, I'm going to count. This is the real thing. I'm going to count and show you how long that bubble takes to go to the top. Some of you near the front may be able to see it. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Did you see how slow that was? Mm -hmm. If it's not real honey, you'll turn it upside down and it will go Because mm. honey is supposed to be thick. And Charles and I went into Publix and they had a display, not your Publix here, this is a Publix in Berea. <laughs> uh, but they had a display of all the different honey jars. And there was a large, <coughs> some large jars of honey that was for $26. And I said, Charles, I wonder if they're real. And I said, but I dare to get up the night look and say, what's she doing with that honey? Charles walks over to the table, big and bold as he is, for those of you who know Charles, he picks up the honey bottle and I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> but you know, the bubble went, Z -Z 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 -Z. Oh. it was, it had been cooked with something. And oh, somebody's going to pay 20 something dollars, but not the real thing. Now, here are some tips. That's the number one you can do before you buy it to know. Another thing that shows you the quality of the honey, never, it's just like the olive oil. When you look at the bottle and it says a product of Canada, Brazil, and the USA, there's no way they can control the quality. If that's coming from Brazil, that's coming from Canada, that's from USA, and then they get a big vat and mix it, the quality is not going to be there. Um, never buy honey if it says ultra filtered. They ultra filter it to remove the pollen so that you can't test to see where it came from. Once they've removed the pollen, you can't tell. Whereas these that still have the pollen in, a scientist could pick it up and tell whether it was from uh, the northern United States or whether it was from China or some other place. So if it's ultra filtrated, don't think, oh, this is nice and clean and pure. No, they're trying to trick you. When we go to Aldi's, look for a sign. There's a sign on there that says, True Source Verified. It's got a little B on it, and it says, True Source Verified. That means that um, it's been inspected and checked, that it's from where it says it is. You know, they've checked, it, the, po checked the pollen and everything like that. So that would be fine to buy. Let's, let's see how quick this one is. Shall we see? I can't remember. I know I tested it at home, and I can't remember whether this was good or not. Here we go. One, two, three, four, five, six. You go, Aldi. Yeah. 69 from Aldi. Choose yeah. very sad. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing I would say about this one is that um, it doesn't, it says, oh yeah, it is from three countries. This is America, Argentina, and Canada. But for sure, they've been more careful with monitoring it because it obviously hasn't been um, uh, diluted, but it is from three countries. So again, it's not the best, but it's better than most. Um, all this does have one that's just from one place, but it doesn't say true source verified. And, and neither did it, does this one. But this is a small independent company. All right, and I think that was it, what I wanted to say about the, the honey. So try to make it just from one place, and don't worry, it should crystallize. Put it in warm water. Now, what about maple syrup? Um, she should be bringing the samples around because I'm making some fudge. Uh, let me just wind up, wind up, and go back a little bit. So, uh, did you, those of you find it in your booklet? And I'm gonna make a I'm gonna make a confession to you. I didn't try to mix it up with you, but I was running hither and thither all day and I left the peanut butter at home. <laughs> so that's why I can't mix it. But I want to say about the peanut butter, make sure the one that you buy just says peanuts and salt. 
Most peanut butters now add sugar and palm oil. The reason why they add the palm oil is because it stops the oil separating. And most people see the oil separating and think, ew, all that oil, and put it down. And they go for the jiff, and it's all nice and mixed in, and they think, okay, this is better. But you see all that oil on top of the peanut butter? That is in jiff, plus they added palm oil. So you can't see it, but it's got more oil than that one, because they added the palm oil to stop it separating. Go, I'm sorry, I don't know. With the smuckers. <laughs> Scraping it right to the bottom and that one. Um, uh, okay, and I'm going to, yes, they're bringing on the fudge, and so you just the olive oil, it, it says they mix it once they get to the point of olive Take a look at this one. All right, and I see that I'm fast running out of time. So um, what I do want to quickly talk about is the fake maple syrup. How you can tell the fake maple syrup is that when you go to the store, it will say pancake syrup with maple flavoring, or it will say bottle and you have to grab it. If you knock over that pancake syrup, it's going to ooze. That's it to honey. Maple is thin, honey is thick. <laughs> The pancake syrup is the, the really thick and thick and oozy, but real maple syrup is really kind of loud. It, it spills and ticks over easily. So, uh, so what you're eating today, we're using carrot and not chocolate, uh, not cocoa powder. What the difference between uh, the carob, carob and uh, the cocoa bee, they've had to let the uh, the cocoa pods cover and ferment for a while, which means it can be easily contaminated with vermin. And plus, um, it has a substance called theobromine that reacts on your brain just like caffeine does. And some argue that it has both. I'm not exactly sure, but uh, it's got that substance in that um, not too good for your brain. So we go with the carob, it's got more iron and it's more naturally sweet. And so basically, as you can see from the recipe, we just combine all that together. Chop your nuts, you don't have to have a wicky dippy chopper. I put my nuts on the table and chop with my hand on top to stop them flying. So you, you don't need to fill your pole, your kitchen equipment. All you do, put your hands on the and chop. And then you mix it together. After the Daniel fast, you must try this recipe with just a teaspoon of vanilla. The vanilla just totally smooths out the flavors. You can't use vanilla on the Daniel fast. But after the Daniel fast, you can use vanilla, and I think you'll enjoy this what recipe you even more. All right, I see that I'm out. I did want to talk to you a little bit about glycemic index, and it hey, is Joe, there in your paper. Go ahead paper. and play that first screen. I want to say index. Now that number just says how quickly it affects you. Can you skip this sugar. slide? Uh, I think you that's know, a simple example. Program, and go to you see that fructose. Now this oh, is the program, didn't it? Uh, fructose controls sugar, we, we but obviously. And uh, fructose has a low glycemic index. Its index is only 20. And again, I'll show you the thing so that you know what I'm talking about. Um, uh, go past the slide where it keeps advancing, and then you can go back Don't to buy fructose. Fructose is metabolized by the liver. And if you use a lot of fructose instead of your regular sweetener, it could cause fatty liver disease. So the only time you really should eat fructose is when you're okay. getting into that. I don't either. That's the best way to get into the fence. All right, I'd like to thank you all very, very much for your attention. And I pray that God blesses each of us as we make those steps for a healthier, new bodies. Thank you.
Good evening, everyone. How is, uh, how is your food? It looks delicious. It looks delicious. And, and Judith, I learned a lot about honey. My, my kids love honey. So we've been going through this thing lately at our house. We have three young children, and they're ages uh, eight, six, and four. And uh, we, we uh, you know, we'll get something like rice checks or, you know, uh, something like that that doesn't have a lot of uh, sugar for the cereal, but we allow them to put a little honey on it. And so because of that, we've been going through so much honey. So we're just going to have to change all of our, our honey habits. Uh, but we learned a lot there, so that's, uh, that's good. There we go. Fantastic. All right. I have a question. How many of you have ever heard of the actor Chris Pratt? Anyone here? Yeah, a few people. He uh, uh, has become famous for uh, some of his movie roles in some of the Marvel, you know, superhero movies. And uh, he actually currently is married to Arnold Schwarzenegger's daughter, which is uh, kind of interesting. Uh, but I found this article a couple of years ago in 2019. And I want to encourage you because this good-looking author, or not author, but good-looking actor, Chris Pratt, also did the Daniel Fast, all right? So yeah, you can look like that. Uh, that's encouraging, right? But notice uh, this, this, uh, this, this, this article in Vox Magazine wrote an entire article, and notice the title of their article. I thought this was fascinating. This is Vox Magazine, a secular uh, magazine that is not interested in promoting Christianity at all. Uh, but, but they said, why Bible-inspired diets and um, fitness plans are catching Who's Chris on? Pratt? Uh, which is kind of interesting. Why would it have to know who Chris Pratt is? Do you mind if I grab is? just a regular mic here? This one's kind of falling off right here. That way I won't be messing with it the whole time. Wonderful. Fantastic. Um, and, uh, and notice what the article says. People who want to get fit, lose weight, and eat more healthily often turn to trainers. Take actor Chris Pratt. He announced last month, this was back in 2019, an Instagram story that he was on the Daniel Fast. It was kind of interesting, right? These are good company. There's some uh, famous people that are doing uh, the Daniel Fast. Uh, but what was interesting to me was the article uh, title. Why Bible inspired would people go to this ancient <coughs> book for advice on health? And some of you may have come into this Daniel fast as a, as a skeptic or a non-believer. And I'm so glad that you're here. Because if someone came up to me and they said, I have a book and it needs to be from God himself. I would be a little skeptical. Really? Your book is from God? Tell me why. So I'm going to give you a, free, a few reasons why I believe that this book the Bible is reliable. You know that this fast is called the Daniel fast. It's based off of a Bible character. Why is the Bible is the Bible reliable? And maybe it's not. Maybe it is. I'll give you a few reasons why I personally think that it's it's uh, it, it's reliable that we can trust uh, this this ancient book. And the first reason uh, that we can trust this book is that the Bible is historically <coughs> consistent. He was having problems. So the with events the Wi-Fi and the, the internet dates connection. and the people that are found in this book, also found in your history books. And I want to uh, give you a, a few uh, facts uh, to, to show you that. Now, uh, scholars who study ancient literature will tell you that there's a time gap between when a piece of ancient literature was written and when the earliest copy is. The shorter that time gap is, the more the time of the ancient time. So, for example, Homer wrote Iliad in 900 that was his original work. But we, as human beings, don't have the earliest copy until 500 B.C. So the 500, 400 year time span between when he wrote it and the earliest copy. And so we would say that's incredibly, really reliable. People who study it, for you. Yeah, say, yeah, that's right. very reliable. Right? Tacitus, who wrote Imperial Rome, when he wrote it, it was in 160 A.D. But we don't have, have the earliest copy until 850 A.D., <coughs> 700 there we years. But that's still yeah. very uh, uh, good for ancient literature. Josephus, there, yeah, a Jewish historian, yeah. wrote his uh, uh, book called The Jewish War. He wrote it in 95 AD. But our earliest copy, right, is not until 800 years later, almost 900 AD. But no uh, uh, historian will tell you 
that Josephus actually didn't write Jewish lore, right? Everyone says there is someone named Josephus. He was a real historical character. He actually wrote the Jew Jewish war, even though there's 800 years the between the two. Router. Or take, for example, Caesar wrote Gallic Wars almost a thousand years between when he wrote it and our earliest copy. But everyone says, no problem, Caesar definitely yeah. wrote the Gallic Wars. But notice this, the New Testament, right, has one of the earliest time gaps Ooh, between uh, when it was written and our first original copy. Right? It was written, uh, obviously, the New Testament has several different authors, so it's written all the way from 40 to 100 A.D. or 95 A.D. or so. But our earliest copy is just 30, 40 years later after the last book was written, so only 90 years between when it was written and our earliest copy, which makes the Bible, uh, and this is not just me saying this, but other secular scholars who, who are not even Christian, as they study ancient literature, they will say, you know, the Bible is historically very reliable. Uh, and, and I could show you some other things that the Bible is very historically consistent. You can just notice a lot of different uh, of these ancient pieces of literature. Uh, we have Aristotle's po Poetics. We have five original, or not original, but ancient manuscripts, right? Uh, five of them. But we say, absolutely, you wrote it. That's pretty good. Right? Homer's Iliad. We have 643. Wow. We have a lot of, of uh, these ancient copies. But the New Testament... We have over 24,000 ancient copies of the New Testament, which is incredible. Now, you may think, out of all those copies, 24,000 of these ancient manuscripts in the New Testament, there's got to be inconsistencies between them. I mean, you know, this is before copy machines, before email, before computers, people writing down by hand. 24,000 different ancient manuscripts, there's got to be inconsistencies between all of them, right? But we're going to find, and I'll show you a, a one a quote uh, to help us understand this, but the Bible is very translationally consistent. Between all those ancient manuscripts, the Bible has been accurately passed down uh, through the years, so much so that uh, one scholar says this. I'll read it uh, here. He says, The New Testament then has not only survived in more manuscripts than any other book from antiquity. We just looked at that information. But it has survived in a purer form than any other great book, a form that is 99.5% pure. In other words, be, be, between all those copies, it's 99.5% similar, which is absolutely incredible when you compare that to other pieces of, of ancient literature. So the Bible is translationally consistent. The Bible is also archaeologically consistent. Right? Uh, just uh, let me give you several examples here. Critics used to believe the Bible is wrong. Because they said that King David was a made-up character. He was a, a legendary, mythical character, but they found no evidence of him in archaeology until 1994. And in 1994, archaeologists discovered an ancient stone slab in northern Galilee that was inscribed with references to King David and the House of David. And since then, they found more and more things where there is not one archaeologist that says, oh, King David didn't exist. They all believe that he was a real historical figure. Here's a couple more uh, examples. Critics used to believe the Bible was wrong. Used to believe that because there was no evidence outside of the Bible that a people group called the Hittites ever existed, right? Uh, it's mentioned, though, the Hittites civilization is mentioned 40 times in the, in the Old Testament. And skeptics said, hey, we can't find this group at all in, in, in archaeology. And so this proves that they didn't exist until in 1906, a German archaeologist named Hugo Winkler was excavating in Turkey. And he discovered the capital city of the ancient Hittite empire, an entire Hittite library and 10,000 clay tablets documenting uh, Hittite civilization. So that myth, all oh, they didn't exist, was debunked, that they actually did. King Sargon is another example. example. Some believe that there was no Sargon at all How until his happen? palace was discovered uh, there in Iraq. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, critics used to believe that the book of Acts was not accurate. Uh, a man named Sir William Ramsey, and he's well known, one of the greatest archaeologists uh, in history, decided to disprove the Bible. He said, you know what, there's no way that this is a, uh, the inspired word of God. That's impossible. So he went out as an archaeologist to disprove the Bible. And after 30 years of archaeological research in the Middle East, this is Ramsey's conclusion. He said, Luke, 
right? And Luke is a physician, a real person. He was a doctor, and he wrote the book of Acts. There's two books that are ascribed to him, his own gospel, the book of Luke, and also the book of Acts. And Sir Ramsey said, Luke is a historian of the first rank. Not merely are his statements of fact trustworthy, this author should be placed along with the very greatest historians. And I found this interesting, that in the book of Acts, Luke mentions 32 countries, 54 cities, nine Mediterranean islands, and 95 people, and he did not get one of them wrong. Every single one of those details are correct. Compare that with the Encyclopedia Britannica, the first year the Encyclopedia Britannica was published, it contained so many mistakes regarding places in the United States that it got recalled. And Judith, that is nothing against you, all right? That's just uh, how it happened, right? <laughs> just kidding. So interesting then. Uh, we could go on. A lot of you have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, but long story short, critics used to believe the Old Testament could not be reliable because there was such a long time period uh, when the Old Testament writings you know, could have been changed or altered. But in 1947, the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, and they compared what they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Were, uh, up in Qumran, there was a cave <coughs> that was throwing rocks up there and discovered some uh, old uh, uh, clay jars, and there were scrolls in there. And, and they found that, that the Bible was accurately passed yeah. down through the centuries. More evidence that we can uh, trust uh, what the Bible has to say. Um, I thought this was interesting from Smithsonian. This is from their Department of Anthropology. Uh, this is in a historic, uh, uh, excuse me, let me get this right, a official uh, statement pertaining to the historical reliability of the Old Testament. But they said the historical books of the Old Testament are as accurate historical documents as any that we have from antiquity, and in fact are more accurate than Egyptian, Mesopotamian, or Greek histories. These biblical records can be used as documents in archaeological work. So this is a, a historical book that we can actually trust. And one uh, archaeologist said, it may be stated categorically that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. Everything they find in the dirt always corresponds with what's in the Bible, which gives me trust as someone who reads the Bible that this book is factual and accurate. Uh, I found as well another reason that I personally I believe that this book is reliable is that the Bible is internally consistent. And, and what do I mean by internally consistent? Uh, what I mean by that is that it's incredible to me that this book was written over a time span of 1,600 years. It's a long time span. And even though the Bible was written over such a long time span, there are similar themes and ideas and subjects throughout the entire thing. Now, because we're at a Daniel fast, we're talking about cooking. Let me use this example. Imagine if you try to write a consistent, unified cookbook, all right, about food over the last 1,600 years, right? You're pulling together information from 1,000 years ago and 1,600 years ago and 400 years ago and trying to pull it together in a unified book. It would be very challenging to do that on any subject. But the Bible, uh, even though there's so many authors, I believe that providentially and divinely, God has inspired his book to, to come together. The Bible is also con uh, culturally consistent as well. How is it possible? There's no other book that people in uh, Africa and people in Asia and people in South America and, 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 and people all over the world in Europe and, and here in North America, that everyone, every culture, right, is impacted uh, by this book, which uh, is, is very encouraging, uh, very encouraging. You know, the Bible, to me, has also been very experientially consistent. Uh, when I've been happy, uh, the Bible has, has encouraged me. Uh, you know, not too long ago, I started a Google Word document, and I'm documenting all the times that the Bible has encouraged me. Because I need to remember these stories. Man, I was discouraged, and I, I came to Scripture, and I opened it up. And, and not too long ago, so, uh, sometime last year, I was flying back uh, from uh, Thanksgiving, and there were several different issues I was wrestling with in my mind, and I was a little bit discouraged. You know, I was leaving my family behind for, you know, a few days uh, uh, to spend time with uh, my in-laws back in Washington State, and just processing a lot of things. And I came to Scripture, uh, and I opened up the Bible and started reading, and what I read and, and what God led me to in the Bible encouraged me. I said, wow, that's what I needed to read. And that's happened to me time. That's a, just a small example 
Or I think the Bible is very experientially consistent. Uh, let me skip that one there. And then lastly, this is the, the last one here. Uh, the Bible is prophetically consistent. Prophetically consistent. What do I mean by that? When you look at other religious books, there's other religious books that also claim to be from God. But the other religious books, the Bible is the only one that has prophecy. In fact, uh, uh, 30% of the Bible is predictive prophecy. Most of, uh, of that apocalyptic literature or that prophecy are in the books of Daniel and Revelation, but they actually and factually and in all reality predict things that are gonna happen in the future, hundreds of years in advance. Maybe incredible if, you know, uh, uh, Frank, I'm looking at you here, wouldn't that be amazing, Frank, if I said, hey, you know, 15 years or 10 years from now, your house and you'll be $10 million. Wouldn't that be amazing? Yeah, right? That'd be fantastic, right? Uh, yes. Now, if that happened, if I was able to predict that, you would start like, oh, that's kind of weird, right? Because um, that doesn't happen, right? Uh, weathermen can really predict uh, our weather, right? Uh, uh, so, you know, people can't just predict the future, but God can. And we see that time and time again. In fact, and we won't go over this uh, whole story, we've talked about it a little bit, uh, named after Daniel, right? He interpreted uh, an ancient literal king named Nebuchadnezzar. He was actually the, the king of Babylon. He had a dream that he could Daniel, providentially, uh, through God's help, uh, remembered the dream. God gave it to him and, and he predicted it uh, or, or, or foretold what it meant. And this this uh, statue actually God foretold got the different kingdoms that would come. Need a person with all the Babylon. Right? And these are, are things that are in God foretold this uh, way in advance. Uh, so those are several different reasons uh, in the Bible. And just real quick, if I could get a small brief plug, um, some of you uh, may be interested in learning more about Bible prophecy in particular. And we're doing a series that I have the, the privilege to, to uh, uh, speak at and present called Revelation of Peace. And it's in the fall of September. So if any of you want to write down uh, in your calendar the date, September 13th to 28th, this will be a free uh, Bible prophecy seminar that will be coming here to uh, Hendersonville. And I hope uh, that each one of you uh, can come. So I know this is kind of blown up here. I apologize. But here are the seven reasons why I personally believe the Bible is reliable. It's historically consistent, translationally consistent, archaeologically consistent, internally consistent, culturally consistent, experientially consistent, and lastly, prophetically consistent. And my invitation to all of you, even if you came in as a Bible skeptic, give the Bible a try, uh, and I believe that you will find that the Bible can be reliable in your life as well. Thank you so much. Pastor Jeff, I'm sorry that I did not introduce you. It's okay, no problem. But I don't think you need an introduction. But my wife is going to scold me. <laughs> hey, no problem. Thank you, Dr. Tryon. It's my privilege this evening to introduce our speaker for the evening. Uh, Jeremy Penn and I have uh, known for uh, some time and I really have grown to appreciate uh, the blessing that he is in my life. He's a physician's assistant. He's also accredited with the, he's certified with the American College of Sports Medicine and has other degrees as well. He's a physician assistant with nearly 20 years experience in a number of specialties, including psychiatry, internal medicine, orthopedics, sports medicine, and yes, even neurosurgery. So if you need a neurosurgical consultation tonight, uh, see me, I'll be happy to hook you up. Leveraging his background and directed a hospital-based corporate wellness program to improve, to improve employee health. You know, that really is, is critical that we work together to find a healthier world that we to live in. He's a seasoned speaker. This, uh, he's uh, national medical, at national medical conferences and public events, and he addresses evidence-based approaches to lifestyle medicine, final chemistry, and this, I'm looking forward to learning more today, and in nutraceuticals. His perspective on translation research uh, to practice have been published in Here We Go, Jeremy Penn. Good 
have one of those days when you get kind of near the end and you feel like you've been on fire all day. I see I'm smoldering a little bit. I'm just trying to catch up. Good to be here this evening. A pleasure to be with you. Uh, looking forward to uh, the topic this evening. So I want to welcome you to the inside story. The inside story. The secrets of the gut microbiome revealed. We're going to talk about the gut microbiome this evening. We're going to talk about why it's important, how we can enhance it, and how significant it is in our life as far as, uh, as, far as health is concerned, as well as disease. It was, in, uh, it was the Hippocrates that was first credited with the, um, that was first credited with the quote of, all disease begins in the gut. And I thought that was really interesting because I'm really interested in, in how did he figure this out? What was it that he was seeing? What was it that he was uh, uh, experiencing that he decided, well, you know what? I think all disease begins in the gut. Because what he said way back then, we're finding is being proven today over and over again. And really not too long ago. It was only in 2005 when PubMed, which is a, a medical database for the st medical uh, studies that are published, published its first article on the human gut microbiome. So we jump to 2021. 6,930 articles published on the human gut microbiome. So over the last four years, there's been about 25,000 studies on the human gut microbiome. Well, why such a, a surge? Why so many and why so recently? It's because in the, in the early 2000s, we could not culture the bacteria in the human gut like we can regular bacteria in a petri dish in a lab. And so with this, we needed to do more advanced technology. And that's where we came up with the gene sequencing technology. There's three different types of gene sequencing technology that we use today. And <clears throat> this stuff is used for, again, identifying the, the various bacteria. And, but more, more importantly is, okay, so we're talking about the human gut microbiome, but how big is it? I mean, it, it can't be that big. My gastrointestinal system goes not that long. But let's take a look at it. You have approximately 100 trillion cells in the human gut microbiome. Wow, okay, so what? So let's put this into perspective. The website Earth and Sky says that on a moonless night, away from all light pollution, nothing out there except for you and the stars, that with the naked eye, you can see 2,500 stars. And I don't know if you've ever been out that far. I remember I was in the academy and I was able to get out in an area uh, in Norway where there was nothing whatsoever and it was amazing to see all of the stars and I'm thinking to myself wow 2500 mm. that's it when after they said so let's take a look at a little bit more then it was a study that was done in in uh, 2020 and they found that all of these cells all put together they all weigh about a total of 3.5 ounces it's not much, but that's a lot of cells. So let's take a look at a little bit more. <clears throat> In our Milky Way galaxy, a few more stars there, there are 100 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So therefore, your human gut microbiome, your microbiome is a thousand fold larger than the Milky Way galaxy. Now that is absolutely extraordinary. And we're going to see why it is that big and what it's needed for. There was a, there was a, approximately a thousand different bacterial species in the human gut, and the exact number though is not known. As recently as 2019, Alameda and others uncovered nearly 2,000 additional candidate bacterial species, which will quote substantially expand the known species, with an increase of approximately 280% in the phylogenetic diversity. 
It was in 2020, the Journal of Frontiers in Microbiology, and they found 1,200 likely bacterial species through genetic analysis. They could only name so many of them, and they found out about 774 they couldn't name yet. So new ones they had just discovered. So in light of this evolving complexity, as we continue to discover more members of the human gut microbiome and its far-reaching impact, researchers are referring to the gut microbiome as an evolving organ system. And when we talk about organ systems, we've got the cardiovascular system, we've got the respiratory system, we've got the, the reproductive system, etc. We've got all these in the medical books. And these are pretty, pretty much, we, we, we almost discovered everything in those. But the human gut microbiome is vastly different because it is ongoing research constantly and they're, and they're coming up with more and more information on this human gut microbiome and how important it is and how much of an impact it has in our life today. But let's take a look at some of the factors that affect our gut microbiome. And we'll talk about some of these kind of as we go through. But just right, on, right out of the gate, Genetics has an impact. Diet has an impact. That's one of the main factors. We're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. Age has an impact. We'll talk about that. As well as emotions. Believe it or not, anxiety and depression affect your gut microbiome. Also, metabolic disorders such as diabetes and irritable bowel disease. Seasonal changes affect your gut microbiome. Stress. Your circadian clock system affects your gut microbiome, as well as probiotics and antibiotics. So a lot of different factors affect the gut microbiome in a lot of different ways. And what scientists were able to find out, <clears throat> in one study that was done in 2015, prior to this study, they were able to see and look at the gut microbiome of infants. Of these infants that are only 90 days old, and they were able to predict, they thought they could predict, that these infants here and these infants here, only these right here, would develop asthma. Now let's back up for a second. These are 90 days old, so they're really small infants. And by looking at the gut microbiome alone, they were able to say these babies here, these infants here, will develop, will develop asthma. So they said, you know what, let's put this to the test. So what they did in 2015, it was a study that was published in Science Translational Medicine. And what the researchers found is that in this particular procedure that they were doing was called a fecal microbial transplant. Now that sounds fun. Well, what they do here is they, the procedure in which they take the feces of one individual and they transplant it into the intestine of another donor, or another individual rather, for the purposes of repopulating the gut microbiome. And generally this, is, generally this is used for major intestinal infections. Well, fecal microbial transplant was what we first referred to. Well, that just sounds kind of poopy. So they said, you know what, we're gonna change this. We're gonna make it sound a little bit better. So we now call it bacterial therapy. That sounds good, you know? Hey, would you, I went to the doctor today, I'm getting some bacterial therapy. Oh, that sounds fantastic. <laughs> Don't even know what it is, right? Better one yet is this one is, uh, in, in, uh, is the intestinal my microbiota transplant. Wow, that seems better. Don't even know what that is. But those are all the same thing. And so with this, the, the scientists did a fecal microbial transplant from the dirty diapers of those infants and they put it into the intestines of these mice to see would they develop any signs of asthma. Sure enough, 100% of the mice that this was put into developed inflamed lungs, which was indicative of asthma. Now that's just asthma. We're gonna take a look at a number of other diseases just a little bit later that have a substantial impact because of our microbiome. But what is our microbiome made of? Is it just bacteria? No, nope. it's got single cell organisms in there. It's got some more complex organisms in there that are predominantly mainly yeasts and that kind of stuff. We, of course, we have bacteria, that's a large collection. And we also have the gut virome. Yes, absolutely, you have viruses that are in your gut that we need there. 
And what the scientists have found so far is that if we're missing some of those viruses that are in there that actually affect other bacteria, right, they're bacteriophages, so they infect just the other bacteria, is that if you're missing some of those viruses, there is a decrease in executive function. And so we want those viruses there because they are beneficial. Okay, so the gut microbiome is related to asthma. It seems to be a connection here. and seems to be a connection to some other places. But how many other places is the gut microbiome affecting? And this is where we get into the axes or an axis. An axis is simply a two-way communication system that takes place. It communicates from one location in the body to another location in the body. But what's interesting, because it's bi-directional, if something affects this, it will affect this. And if something affects this, it will turn and affect this. It's bi-directional communication. So what are the different axes, if you will, does the body have with the gut microbiome? What have we discovered so far? There are 10 axes. Let's go through them. 1980, the first axis was discovered, 1980, the gut-brain axis. What that means is what we found with this is that the connection between the gut and the brain is a direct communication via the vagus nerve. It goes from the brain to the gut. It's the longest and most circuitous or snake-like nerve that we have. And what was interesting in this communication that is direct between the gut and the brain is that 80% of the nerve fibers that are in this nerve, in this communication axis, goes from the gut to the brain. We thought it was opposite. Brain's more important. The brain affects everything in the gut. Mm -hmm. It is the gut that has a substantial impact as far as the brain is concerned. So this was the first axis that was discovered. In 1987, the gut and vascular axis was discovered. And here's where they found that the gut microbiome has an impact on the blood vessels as well as circulation, and also cardiovascular health. Then in 2008, there was the gut-liver axis, but what was different with this one is that it was a three-way communication system. No other axis was like this. It was a three-way communication system, and it was interesting because this one actually affects and coordinates digestion, as well as metabolism, and it regulates bile production. Three ways, it connects from the gut, it connects to the gut epithelium, and it also connects to the liver. Three different ways. The only one to do this so far that we've found. Then we've got the gut, the, uh, the gut, here we go, the uh, gut skin axis. The gut skin axis, and this was discovered, actually, actually was first postulated in 1930. In other words, well, we think there's a connection between the gut and the skin, but it was only in 2011, with the technology we have today, that we're able to find out, hey, truly, there, there is a connection here. Mm. Absolutely. Also in 2011, the gut kidney axis was discovered. Kidney dysfunction is associated with the gut microbiome, and vice versa, and can, it can negatively impact the gut microbial community. Then in 2015, the, the gut and lung access. This helps to coordinate immune, uh, the immune responses as well as plays a significant part in lung diseases. Then in 2016, the gut bone access was first discovered and first written about. This regulates bone density as well as skeletal health. 2017, the gut muscle access. Gut muscle access, again, huge communication that takes place throughout the system from our gut to the rest of our uh, muscles throughout the body. And in 2017, finally, it comes up, the heart-gut axis. There's a connection between the heart and the gut microbiome, and it plays a significant part in small things you might have heard before, like coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, high fats, infections of the heart as well. Then finally, in 2021, most recently, is the gut testes access. And they found that the gut microbiome has an impact 
on spermatogenesis, which is very interesting. And the research is ongoing with this. And what's, what's interesting, though, is just in 2021, there were 20 studies on this topic alone, just on the gut testes axis by itself. Now, we've gone through 10 of these axes. These are, each one of these axes are major research fields. So this will continue to develop over time and continue to get bigger and bigger. So if we look back and just take, take a step back and take kind of a global picture, we see this. The gut microbiome has an impact on your brain, on your vascular system, on your liver, your skin, your kidneys, your lungs, bone, muscles, system, cardiovascular system, and reproductive system. That is substantial, huge impact. <clears throat> Cancer stinks. No one wants it. We've all had friends, family that either have it, either have it, or passed away from it. And what we found is that it it literally does sting. There's a study done in 2011, and already they know that the gut bacteria are associated with breast cancer, gastric cancer, <clears throat> esophageal cancer, pancreatic cancer, laryngeal cancer, liver, gallbladder cancers. So what they wanted to find out was could they detect colon cancer by just stool specimens? Okay. So what they did is they took a series of stool specimens from individuals who had colon cancer and others who did not. And they did a test that was rather unusual and they used dogs. And what they found is that dogs can detect colon cancer from a series of stool specimens. Wow. This is not something you would go to your veterinarian for, trust me. <laughs> so the next, next question is, what's the accuracy? Because we've got some high-end equipment today and procedures that are very accurate. But what's the accuracy? The accuracy, what they found in this study in 2011 that was published in the journal Gut, 98% accuracy. Wow. These dogs don't know who you are. They don't know your age. They don't know your comorbidities. They don't know your family history. They don't know your lifestyle practices. They just smell your poo. 98% accuracy. That's pretty extraordinary. We're finding out now today that we can tell someone's age by just evaluating the stool specimen, having no other information just by looking at that. Wow. So the question is, so what are the products that the gut microbiome makes that are so important to us and why they're beneficial? Well, we know that the gut microbiome synthesizes mostly B vitamins through a process of fermentation of carbohydrates, predominantly plant fibers. So, fiber, uh, so fermentation does play, take place in our body and it is very beneficial for our body. The gut microbiome also produces short chain fatty acids. These short chain fatty acids are the key drivers in regards to health as well as disease. We want those short chain fatty acids. We'll talk about those a little bit. In a, in a systematic review published in uh, 2022 by Guterman, found that B12 is synthesized and utilized by bacteria in the human gut microbiome and is required by over a dozen enzymes in bacteria versus only two enzymes in human. So B12 has a greater and more significant impact on your gut microbiome in regards to enzymes than on you personally as far as your personal enzymes are concerned. But at this point, I mean, it sounds great, but <clears throat> we don't have any assistant, uh, systematic reviews right now. I'm sure they're gonna be forthcoming. 
any systematic reviews that have been conducted to evaluate the impact of B12 on the gut microbiome or its implications for human health. But I stand here and promise it's coming. With the wealth of information that's being researched right now, it's just a matter of time. So these short-chain fatty acids that we talked about before, these play key roles in the gut barrier integrity, in glucose homeostasis, lipid metabolism, as well as they also regulate the immune system, regulate the inflammatory response, as well as blood pressure. But I want to talk just a little bit about this gut barrier integrity. Well, who cares? Why does that matter? Here's why it matters. Because these gut bacteria help to create a barrier between your gut and the outside of the gut. So what? The reason why that's important is because right next to your gut is the major part of your immune system. It's known as the, the gut-associated lymphatic system, or GALT. It lays right next to it. So if your barrier integrity is solid like this, nothing can get through to then touch this immune system and then stimulate it for inflammation. We think about our lymph nodes as being part of our immune system, and, and we've, got, uh, we've got white blood cells that circulate throughout the system as far as our immunity is concerned. 70% of your immune system is in your gut. However, if there is a problem with that barrier because those gut microbiome aren't functioning like they're supposed to or you don't have enough of them, then we get little holes. And it goes right through and then these proteins of the foods we're eating and so forth come and impact that immune system. And now it starts an inflammation response. Now it starts an inflammation response that has an impact in a number of different diseases, which we're going to look into in just a little bit. And that's why that gut barrier integrity is so important. We want to guard that, if you will, if you will, with everything that we can. <clears throat> so how does age impact our microbial composition? How does a young person or a fetus or an older person, is it the same all through life? Well, originally we thought that a fetus came through the birth canal and had a sterile gut microbiome. Well, as of 2018, 2019, two studies published showing that the fetus does have bacteria in the gut prior to birth. However, it is during the birthing process that is so critical. That's why when we talked about before just a little bit, we talked about the birth, the birth mode or the mode of birth is so important. Whereas, is it vaginal or was it cesarean section? Why does this matter? Well, we've got a couple of different microbiomes. Tonight we're talking about the, the human gut microbiome. There's also, there's the gut microbiome, there's the vaginal microbiome, there's the oral microbiome. These are all different microbiomes. And so the, the oral of a female, the oral micro, I'm sorry, the, the gut microbiome and the vaginal. At the 37th week of pregnancy, these two microbiomes come together, they hear each other, and then, the baby passes through that canal. Well, why does that happen? The reason why it happens is so that when the baby passes through the canal, it's greater inoculation of bacteria to start to build, develop, and diversify the microbiome that it has. And then, of course, breastfeeding is also important. Why? Because of the HMOs that are found in breast milk, the human milk oligosaccharides. These are specifically there. It's the third most predominant component in breast milk. And they're solely there to feed the gut bacteria. They do not have a significant impact on the infant's nutrition. They help to feed that bacteria, to help it grow. Because, again, like we talked about, this bacteria is a live organism. And if you don't feed it, it dies. Just like any of you. Doesn't matter where we put you. If we just take all the food away for an unlimited amount of time, I guarantee you, you will push enough daisies. All right? Everyone needs food. Bacteria need food as well. So these HMOs provide that for these little infants. And right now, the global rate of cesarean sections deliveries has been increasing. And it's around right now about 21%, which is above the 10 to 15% that the World Health Organization says this is the maximum you should have. We're at 21%. Mm. The growth trend right now is expected to reach 29%. Wow. 
by 2030. The reason why that's important is for what I just said. Because we need that inoculation. We need that in there because of the impact that it has on our, on our overall health. In a study by Leidy and others, they found an associated, association between aging and the changes in microbial populations. And what they found is that there was a decrease, not only there was a decrease in a uh, number of bacterial families, but there was also an increase in others. But the ones that increased were the ones that were disease producing. So as we continue to age, if we don't do anything about our gut microbiome, if we don't take into account, hey, what is it I'm feeding myself right now? What am I putting in my body right now? How am I feeding my gut microbiome? How am I taking care of it? That we will lose that diversity. We will lose that barrier integrity. We will build these weedy, if you will, these weedy species like weeds in a garden. And then they cause more and more problems for us as we continue to age. So we need to watch out after it. So let's take a look at gut dysbiosis. Dysbiosis is just a really cool term. And it simply means an imbalance. It's an imbalance in the gut microbiome. And it's an imbalance between the good ones and the bad ones. And when we have that imbalance, then we have problems. And so that's what we want to kind of take a look at. <clears throat> So what are the factors? Some major factors that have an impact on the gut microbiome are high sugar diets, that's almost a no-brainer, high sugar diets, high salt diets also has a substantial negative impact on the gut microbiome, ultra-processed foods, high saturated fat diets, and one that's very popular today is high protein diets. They have a substantial negative impact on the gut bacteria. Also, severe interventions like antibiotics. No, I'm not saying don't use antibiotics. <clears throat> what I'm saying is you have to realize it does have an impact, a substantial impact, because most of the antibiotics we use are broad spectrum. Most of the gut bacteria or the gut microbiome is bacteria. And so it's just a, it just kind of wipes a lot of stuff out. <clears throat> and some researchers some researchers refer to the gut microbiome as a, as a lawn, if you will. Just like you would take care of your lawn at your house with feeding and watering and lime and, and aeration, all the other kind of stuff. It's the same thing with the gut microbiome in that if you're taking an antibiotic, a lot of times it will do it. It wipes it out almost bare. It doesn't go all the way. We know that. And some of it is replaced as we continue to get over that illness and stop taking antibiotics. But some bacteria is wiped out, never to return. And this was really interesting, this was an interesting discovery in regards to science because we thought, oh, they're always there. <clears throat> they always stay there, and you go down to take a dip and you come back up, and it's not a problem. It doesn't work that way. And so again, antibiotics do have a significant impact, but there's ways that we can help to enhance the, the regrowth, if you will, in diversity, which we'll get into. It was Dr. Uh, Dr. Bolshewitz. He is a <clears throat> he has a well-referenced book called Fiber Fuel. Fantastic book. He's double board certified in internal <clears throat> medicine as well as gastroenterology, and he makes a list. And what I want you to do is, if you've got a pen and paper, I would like you to take that out because I want you to start making some checks. Much like you're counting things, you go one, two, three, four, line across. If there's five, one, two, three, four. Okay. I want you to take that out. <clears throat> And if any of these apply to you, your family, friends, relatives, just put a little check there. It's about a mathematician. He worked it all. All right, we're going to go through two categories. The first category is going to be intestinal symptoms of gut dysbiosis, and the next one is going to be extra intestinal, so things that affect outside of the intestines. In looking at the symptoms of gut dysbiosis, ready? Here we go. Abdominal pain, cramping, gas, bloating, abdominal distension, food sensitivities, diarrhea, constipation, mucus in your stool, nausea, indigestion, heartburn, gastro reflux, belching. All right. How many have five? How many have five? Well, raise your hand, guys. Come on. 
Raise your hand. You got five? Okay. All right, five. List them again. Okay, I'll go through them quickly. We've got abdominal pain. We've got cramping. We have gas, bloating, abdominal distension, food sensitivities, diarrhea, constipation, mucus in the stool, nausea, indigestion, heartburn, and reflux, as well as belching. It doesn't, it's either, it's either all the time or frequently. All the time or frequently. If it's occasional here and there, no. We've got 10. All right, so five. <clears throat> five or more? Nope. Okay. Nope. All right, let's, uh, seven or more. Seven or more? All right. Ten or more? All right, we've got some winners there. Ten or more. All right. Now, let's take a look outside the intestinal system. What are some things that are indicative of gut dysbiosis that take place outside the intestines? Here we go. Ready? Now, make a new list so you don't so you don't blend them together. Make a new list, new list, same thing. Here we go. We have weight gain. We have fatigue. Brain fall. Difficulty concentrating. Mood imbalance. Anxiousness. Anxious, being anxious, anxiety, skin breakouts, joint pain, muscle aches, weakness, bad breath, sinus congestion, shortness of breath, wheezy. <clears throat> All right, let's take a look at the winners. Five or more? Uh, we got more on the extra intestinal. Okay, five or more. Uh, seven or more? Seven or more? Got some there, very good, okay. And uh, 10 or more? Yeah, 10 or more, all right then, very good. We'll give you guys a Bucky Beaver badge after the lecture. All right, so you can see that this has an impact in a lot of different areas. But really, let's get, let's get down to the nuts and bolts. <clears throat> let's get down to the actual disease process themselves. So now we're going to make a separate list. Same thing. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to go through a different classification of disease from dermatology and skin things, immune system and so forth. That doesn't matter, okay? You're going to keep going with your list. Just check, 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 okay? All that apply. Now, when we talk about these diseases here, if you don't know what it is, don't worry about it because you don't have it. Neither <laughs> your, neither your, your relatives, okay? So, we're going to do that, and then I'm going to go from category to category. You don't change anything, you just keep checking if they apply to you, friends, or family. All right? Here we go. <clears throat> okay, we're going to start with dermatological diseases, which are skin. Here we go. Psoriasis. Atopic dermatitis. Uh, acne vulgaris. Rosacea. Alopecia areata. So we've got some balding going on. Uh, Hydratitis superative. That's just skin. Now we're switching to the immune system and immune mediating things that are associated with the gut microbiome. Diabetes type 1, celiac disease, multiple sclerosis, asthma, food allergies, eczema, seasonal allergies, eosinophilic esophagitis, dermatitis herpetiformis. Psoriasis and psoriatic arthritis, scleroderma, chronic fatigue, antiphospholipid syndrome, restless leg syndrome, Sjorgen's syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, microscopic colitis, ankylosing spondylitis, lupus, intestinal or interstitial say cystitis, autoimmune hepatitis, primary biliary cholangitis, primary sclerosing cholangitis, sarcoidosis, fibromyalgia, gillian barre syndrome, Beckett's disease, Kawasaki disease, ANCA-associated vasculitis. All right. Moving on, metabolic diseases, obesity, diabetes type two, coronary artery disease, hyperlipidemia, chronic kidney disease, gout, 
non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, alcohol, alcoholic steatohepatitis, acute alcoholic hepatitis, um, alcoholic cirrhosis, acute pancreatitis, and chronic pancreatitis. Two categories left, stick with me. Endometriosis, switching over to the endocrine system and hormones. So we've got endometriosis. We've got polycystic ovarian syndrome. We have endometrial hyperplasia, female infertility, sexual dysfunction. Sexual dysfunction will apply to men as well as women. Hypothyroid, breast cancer, endometrial cancer, prostate cancer, and erectile dysfunction. Last but not the least is neuropsychiatric, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, schizophrenia, ADHD, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. We already mentioned anxiety. Don't check that again. We've already got that one here, but that's here again. Depression. We did mention that one before, so depression. Autism spectrum disorders, bipolar disorders, migraine headaches, as well as hep uh, hepatic encephalopathy, post-traumatic stress disorder, and obsessive compulsive disorder. Now, what if you haven't been officially the winner. All right, what do we got? Ten? How many people have ten or more? Ten or more. Oh, really? Okay, ten or more. All right, ten or more checks. Very right, good. All right, how about uh, 20 or more checks? 20 or more? We got 20? 30 or more? 40 or more? 50 or more? How many have more than 70? Anybody? No? All right, that's roughly 86 different diseases. That's a substantial impact. That's a substantial impact in regards to what your gut microbiome has and has the ability to impact. <clears throat> so let's take a look at how do we improve this. How do we improve our gut health? In a study, in an article that was written in 2022, published in the journal Nature Reviews, Gastro, Gastroenterology and Hepatology, the researchers write this. One universal, healthy gut microbiome does not exist. So you're like, what are you up there for? All right? The reason why this is important is because it's not necessarily going, you're trying to match one particular one that's out there because everybody's different. Our gut microbiome is so individual that is like a fingerprint. Even identical twins Identical twins have a completely different microbiome, and we can tell the difference. They're more similar uh, between those two than they are with other family members, but they're, again, vastly different from anybody else. So your gut microbiome is different than everybody else's. The idea is we want to continue to develop our gut microbiome. We want to continue to take care of it. We want to continue to avoid the things that are going to negatively impact the gut microbiome. At the same time, we also want to do things that are going to positively impact the gut microbiome. So how do we do that? Less than 3% of Americans, 3% of Americans are getting the recommended amount of daily fiber. So that means 97% of Americans are not getting the amount that they need. Well, okay, so, so what? The reason why that's important is because this is major food that your gut microbiome feeds on. So where do we get it? Fruits, vegetables, nuts, greens, seeds, legumes. These are your beans. That's where we get it from. Well, what about the benefit? I'm mixing my drink and just... Nope. Won't work. Studies show us that an isolated fiber like this does not have the same impact on the gut microbiome as whole foods do. That's why the fiber is so important, but yet only 3% of Americans are getting what is recommended as far as the regular daily allowance, or recommended daily allowance. In 2014, a study was, a study was conducted in which they found that if, if 
only 50% of Americans ate only three grams of fiber more daily. Okay, three additional grams of fiber. That's like an apple, a small apple. An additional apple a day. This would save, we just talked about 86 some different diseases, right? It would save us in excess of two billion dollars. And that's just for constipation alone. Mm. Doctors make a lot of money. Mm. I don't have to see two billion dollars. Yeah, two billion dollars. Two billion dollar <coughs> cost because of constipation. This is, an, this is an extraordinary finding. That's just one disease process. What would be the impact on all the other disease processes? The American Gut Project. So really, how much fiber do we need to have? That's the question. Some of you are like, well, hey, I want to do something about this. I want to be able to you know, take control of my gut microbiome and really take care of it like I should be. Well, wonderful. Let's take a look at what the American Gut Project says. This was co-founded in November of 2012 by Rob Knight, PhD, and two other PhDs. So, okay, so what? This project is the largest published study to date on the human gut microbiome. Absolutely extraordinary. The, the project's goal is to better understand the human, human microbiomes, as well as which types of bacteria, where they live, how much of each, and also how are they influenced by diet, lifestyle, as well as disease. In their study, they found that you need 30 different plant species a week. 30 different plant species a week. So we've talked about the different categories, fruits, vegetables, nuts, grains, seeds, legumes, right? Within those categories, obviously, you know this. There's multiple fruits, multiple vegetables, multiple grains, multiple different types of beans and legumes, right? All types of options. And what they said is that 30 plant species a week was the most significant. Now, if you hear nothing else, hear this. Dr. Rob Knight, co-founder of the American Gut Project, writes this, quote, the single greatest predictor of a healthy gut microbiome is the diversity of plants in our diet, end quote. We want diversity. As we continue to get older, we lose that diversity. We want that diversity. And so we can enhance that diversity by, again, increasing the amount of plants that we're taking in per day, I'm sorry, per week, rather. But really, what does it boil down as far as fiber is concerned? Because we know fiber is the primary fuel source for the gut bacteria. How much fiber do I need? Here it is. What science is showing us now is we need between 40 to 50 grams of fiber per day. Okay, so then how do I start that? Well, right now, Americans, the rough average per day is about 17. Granted, some of you may be uh, more than that, and that's fine. But when I'm talking to patients, I tell them, automatically assume you're at 20. We're just gonna start there. Now, here's what you do not wanna do. Go home, get fired up, open up those can of black beans, and start going. Man, this is fantastic. When you're having beans three times a day, all right? Woo, I'm gonna get that 50 by next week. This is gonna be awesome. Don't do it, here's why because you will be gassy, bloated, and crampy. And then you're gonna say, oh my goodness, this is a horrible diet, I don't wanna do this, what's this guy talking about? Why do you feel that way if this fiber source is so good for us? The reason why is because if you haven't been eating a high fiber diet on a regular basis, then you don't have the bacteria in the gut to be able to take care of the fiber you're putting in. But that's okay, because we can adapt overcome and change well into our 90s. So here's what we do. Is let's say, starting from your perspective, we're at 20. So we wanna go up to 25 a day, 25 grams of fiber a day. 25 grams of fiber, we do it for seven days. We get to the end of the seven days, we go up to 30 grams of fiber, okay? For seven days. We go up to, what's the next one? 35. 40, then 45, and 50. So we do it seven days at a time. We increase each week by five grams of fiber per day. Does that make sense to everybody? 
And so over time, we will get to that 40 to 50 grams. But we need time to build up that bacteria so we can take care of the, the fiber you're putting in. Now, can I just eat just black beans? Because I love black beans. You could, but the problem is that you're going to be starving some of the other bacteria. This is a perfect, a perfect example here of the way everything is set up. Because we're going to pretend that each table is a group of bacteria, if you will. All right? So this table here eats the, loves the fiber for black beans. And this table here loves the fiber for garbanzo beans. But this table back here likes the fiber from lima beans. And it keeps going like this. That's why the importance of the 30 different plant species a week is you keep getting that diversity of foods, that diversity of fiber. You, can't, you have so many classes of, fiber, of, of, of bacteria in there, and they need the different types of fiber that are out there. So don't just stick to one. Branch out. Try some new stuff, but add it in on a regular basis. All right, so we know how to take care of it. We know fiber is critical. We know the different plant species as far as how much we need to have. But how do I know it's even working? Ah, <laughs> if you can't tell, you know, how, how are you going to make any changes? I mean, how do you know? There's a lot of things we can tell, but now we have the technology. Now we have the technology that actually was designed by the American Gut Project. And if you want to take a look at the website, it's called Keen Health, Keen, K-E-A-N, KeenHealth.com. K-E-A-N, Keen Health. Now, there you can go, and you can get a microbiome kit. And there you can buy it, and they'll send it to you. You'll get a very small fecal sample. It'll take you like 15 seconds, because it's a small little brush, and send it back in, all sterile and everything, and send it back to them, and in a matter of about three weeks, it just depends, you will get a 58-page report. Yes, it's not just, hey, it looks good, have a good day. No, these guys take this subject very seriously. So in the report, it's going to include an, an overall gut profile. It's going to include the bacteria in your gut that are problematic and beneficial. It's also going to be, have a, a probiotic profile in there for you. It's also going to list the good bacteria that's in there. It's also going to list wellness factors that impact your gut microbiome, also affect your metabolism as well as an appendix of, term, appendix of terms. So if you're reading something and you're like, what, what is that? Flip to the back, there's the term, explains it right there in layman's language, very easy. And then it's got a whole list of references that you can go and look up in your leisure time. So again, 58 page report, absolutely huge. I recommend individuals do this at least twice a year, if you can't do it twice a year, do it once a year to find out where you're at. Because as we know, the gut microbiome has a substantial impact on many of our health conditions that we're facing today. So whether it's autoimmune or whether it's chronic, etc. And so we want to take care of this gut microbiome as best as we can. So tonight we've talked a lot about the gut microbiome. We've looked at factors that affect the gut microbiome. We've talked about some of the bacteria that are in there. We've talked about some of the disease processes that are, that are affected by the gut microbiome. We've talked about the axes of the gut microbiome and how it's communicating with literally every part of your body. Nothing's left out. And we've talked about how to increase the health of your microbiome. The foods to feed it, how much to feed it. And finally, we added and finished with how to monitor your gut microbiome so that you can live, live long and healthy and productive lives. Irregardless of how old you are now, you can still continue to change and make a difference and make an impact on your gut microbiome, which will pay off dividends. Thank you so much uh, for this evening, for your time and for your attention. I've got uh, about 15 minutes uh, for, for the questions that you may have. Yes. Yes, sure does. Yes, it does. I tried to pull up your uh, site, thekeenhealth.com, 
And it says Safari can't open the page because it couldn't establish a secure connection to the server. Okay, well then that might be because it's a, it's a server problem as opposed to a website problem. So you can try it, uh, try it when you get home and also try it on, um, try it on Google Chrome or, or, uh, or Firefox. I saw another hand back here, two of them back there. Okay. Um, oh, okay. You got it. Mike, I got it. Mike, so. Okay, got it. <laughs> Sorry. Well, listen to um, you then. Yes. Uh, I did find that first time, keenhealth.com. Okay. Uh, okay, on my phone. Okay. Uh, I have several questions, because uh, I've been waiting to ask about this. <laughs> uh, charcoal. Yeah. Activated charcoal. Is that uh, something you should not use unless you absolutely need to? No, active charcoal, active charcoal, you can do that on a regular basis. What we find that it doesn't, at least what I've found so far, is it does not, it does not interfere with the gut microbiome substantially. So again, this is, a, this is an evolving uh, science. At this point, we don't have anything to indicate that we can't use activated charcoal. Okay, cooked versus raw. If I have my food to eat for the fiber aspect of it, is it better to eat it raw or better to cook it? Okay. As, fiber, as far as the fiber aspect is concerned, you can eat it, eat it either way. But if you want to go a step further, it's the raw that's better. The reason why is because you've got the live enzymes that are in there. Enzymes actually start to slow down as far as function is concerned at 115 degrees and they die at about 130. So raw, if you can do raw, fantastic. Okay. Just eating better. Uh, probiotics, if you can bind the pill or yep. the form of formula on that. Uh, is, do those work? If so, when should I take them in regards to eating, and, uh, and how should I, I take them? All right, good question. This is, does everybody have a question kind of like that in regards to probiotics and, and how to take them? A couple of you, okay, here's what you want to do. There's a, there's a couple of things you want to look at, because it's not just any probiotic. Here's what you want to get. You want to get something that has a quantity of 25 to 30 billion. 25 to 30 billion that are mixed bacteria, not just one single bacteria. You know, hey, lactobacillus, you know, 25 billion. You know, avoid that. <laughs> All right? You want to get a mixture. Also, you want to get, <clears throat> also you want to get a uh, look on the bottle there where it says the guaranteed quantity at expiration. The guaranteed quantity in the tablet or capsule, capsules what you want, at expiration. Look for that. Of course, allergen-free, we want that. That means free of dairy, eggs, nuts, seafood, soy, wheat, gluten, etc. Also, a couple more points, a delayed release capsule. Delayed release capsule. Go through, the, it'll go through your stomach, get into your GI system, and then release. That's what we want. And finally, packaging blister packs are the best because the humidity does affect and damage the bacteria. Again, these are live organisms. A lot of people just think, oh, just give me that and just throw it down. But they don't realize that a humidity can affect the bacteria. In addition to that, is if you're not eating fiber and you pop a, and you pop a probiotic, it doesn't do much good because you just starve the bacteria to death. You popped a probiotic but didn't feed it with fiber on a daily basis. Make sense? As we talked about, that's the primary food source. And finally, refrigeration. Last thing. If it does not require refrigeration, it's better. All right, moving on. Last question. Okay, last question. Uh, I, I was very curious about infants because I noticed uh, whenever my wife had our, our first child and she was breastfeeding exclusively that the, the poop would come out and it looked like uh, cottage cheese and mustard would mm -hmm. hardly no smell to it. Yeah. Uh, but as soon as we started giving them formula, you know, then, wow. It was like, keep this thing away from me. Yeah. Is that all the cause of the change in the micro, the gut microbiome? Yeah, if there's if there's a lot of smell to the, if there's a lot a strong smell to the feces, it's a, it's a problem with the, it's a problem with the uh, metabolism of proteins. So again, it, it's it's that but if it's an if it's an infant, it can be the fact that they have an allergy or a sensitivity to actually lactose, uh, which is in most formulas. Okay, my question is um, with reference to infants too. Um, normally, it is said that an infant doesn't develop an uh, antibody system until they're at least six months old. So if the mother is breastfeeding, and she, of course, the baby is getting the um, mother's colostrum, right? How is that related to the baby's uh, microbiome? Because you say that the baby normally does not have, well, we once thought the baby was clear, 
but you're saying that because if it's a vaginal delivery, that there is an, um, an element of some portion of the microbiome. How, how is that related? Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah, thinking? I think I think I understand. I think I understand what you're saying. So the colostrum, how does it contribute to the microbiome for an infant? Oh, as far as the colostrum is concerned. Yeah. That one I specifically don't know as far as the colostrum. There's a number of studies on colostrum, but I honestly can't speak to that and say, oh, colostrum does this, this, this to the gut microbiome. But I'm sure there's studies out there. A couple of things here. I wanted to ask you, first of all, about the probiotics. I, I recommend to people, even myself, to do fermented uh, vegetables, fruits, and things like that to stimulate or for their probiotic and stimulate, you know, uh, good motility and all that stuff. And that works, do you recommend those? Uh, uh, to be honest with you, I do recommend those uh, in regards to in regards to the fermentation process. Some people don't, um, but in regards to the, the science that we have today, it is really very powerful and overwhelming in regards to what we can get it. Now, what we want to do is we don't want to just live off of fermented foods. We can't do that, right? But these fermented foods, the high quality ones, have large amounts of probiotic, which is fantastic. Um, and of course, of course, we also have a natural fermentation process that takes place in our gut as well. But um, all things fermented, not necessarily what we're talking about fermented like fruits, or not fruits, but more vegetables is better. That's the way I'd go. And changing probiotics, people who take, say, one type of, one, one brand, mm -hmm. I've always heard it recommended to switch probiotics, as you spoke to earlier, to get more diverse bacteria among different bacteria. So that's one thing I wanted to ask about. Now, I, the first question I had, and I was kind of picking back, I have um, the, what do you call it? Uh, it's a bowel problem. I'm trying to think of it if this was diagnosed. It's a, it's a family thing. Diverticulitis a couple years ago. A couple years ago. And they told me to kind of watch how much uh, fiber I take. What do you recommend? How much can I take having uh, diverticulitis? And that's something where, to be honest with you, I would recommend, I would, because he does cover this, is Dr. Bolshewitz's book called, called Fiber Fuel. I'd recommend that for you, for individuals who have uh, issues with diverticulitis or irritable bowel syndrome or irritable bowel disease. Um, I'd recommend his book. Again, he is uh, double board certified in internal medicine and gastroenterology. And he deals with this in much more detail. Okay? Oh, yeah, you want to spell his name? Good luck. Um, yeah, I, I, someone said this to me. I was like, what? Okay, here it is. It's Dr. Will. That's his first name. Last name is spelled B U L S E I W I C Z. The book is entitled Fiber Fuel. Dr. Bolshewitz. Yes. How does one go about figuring out how many grams of fiber in a day? Uh, I don't know how to do that. And also, what is the cost on this Keen study you've been talking about? Okay. The Keen study, I'll, I'll answer the, the last question first, is the Keen study really isn't that expensive. I think it's a little over 100, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for that. But again, the volume of information you're getting is extraordinary. Not only the volume of information, but also the impact of the gut microbiome on multiple different disease processes is extraordinary. We all know that you can pay a lot of money, two, three, four hundred dollars for one test uh, on looking at this particular thing or that particular thing, but this is looking at multiple things at one time. So definitely worth it. And then the, the next question was how do I find out how much fiber I'm taking per day? This is where you would actually get onto the internet and you're gonna learn how to use the internet in regards to, hey, I had a, I had a uh, roughly a, a cup of oatmeal this morning, you know, with uh, you know, two cups or a cup of strawberries, etc. So you get online and you start looking up, well, how much is a cup of oatmeal? Well, how much is, you know, two cups of, so you're gonna measure this stuff out to begin with. Is this something you're always gonna do? No. You will get to the point where you will look, you'll be able to look and go, this is roughly 20, 25, this is you know, 15, whatever. But you want to get to the point where you can do this as opposed to just going like, ah, oh, yeah, I think that's good, you know? It, it's not enough. Over and over and over, I've seen patients go, yeah, I've had enough. We calculate it out, way below. So this is a, this is a, this is a lifestyle, and this is a lifestyle in which, in which you don't need to count calories, count carbohydrates, count proteins, count fats, uh, look at portion control, it's just fiber. 
That's the most important aspect. Question. Two, I have two questions. First of all, uh, what is the difference between probiotic and prebiotic? And the second one, uh, could you discuss just a little bit uh, the danger, the impact of the sugar, a lot of sugar um, on, in the diet? How does that specifically hurt people? And is sugar addictive? Uh, okay, all right then. All right, is sugar addictive? The, the answer is yes, it is addictive. Without question, we know that it is addictive. Now in psychiatry, we don't necessarily have that ICD-10 code saying sugar addiction. We don't have it. You know what, if I stay here long enough, maybe it'll come in, but as of this time, we don't have that. Um, but as far as, uh, so sugar, yes, it is addictive. What's the difference between prebiotics and probiotics? <clears throat> From your perspective, prebiotics are over here. These are the foods that feed the probiotics. All understand that? So prebiotics, they feed the probiotics. Okay, okay, so why is that important? Because these probiotics now make postbiotics. These postbiotics are the short chain fatty acids. These are the things that you want. These are the things, that you, this is why you're eating this way, etc. because you want those short chain fatty acids. So we've got three steps, prebiotic, postbiotic, po uh, I'm sorry, you've got your prebiotic, and then your probiotic, and then your postbiotic, all right? So that's how they work. And sometimes you'll see, sometimes you'll see, uh, you'll see uh, probiotics and say, hey, it has prebiotics in it. And that's a new term actually that was, that was uh, just came about in 1995, 1995. And the, the term is called symbiotic, not symbiotic, symbiotic. And symbiotic is, is specifically associated with prebiotics, uh, prebiotics, and then probiotics, and how they work together. It's a symbiotic relationship, so it's called a symbiotic. So sometimes you'll see in, pro, in uh, probiotics, hey, we have prebiotics in there. That means they put a little fiber in there for the, for the bacteria. Now, let me just make this clear. Just because that's on there doesn't mean that that's all you need to do. That's like me sending you on a long, extensive, hard journey into a very rough environment, and I give you a snack bag. All right? You need to eat fiber on a daily basis. You need to eat it at every single meal, and you need to be looking and seeing how much you're taking in on a regular basis. All right, any other questions? I have a question. What? Simply a oh. matter of clarification. And did I hear you correctly when you said that the probiotics are best if they are not refrigerated. Yes, yes. Why? Because they're more stable. If they're more stable, then you can, you, you can leave it out. A lot of times we thought, oh, it has to be, it has to be, um, you know, it has to be uh, refrigerated. But now we know that the more stable they are, it doesn't have to be refrigerated. Yeah. Any more? Last question? Last question, because I'm eight o'clock here. I want to get you guys out of here. Foods, what foods you would recommend? Okay, it's not necessarily the foods that I would recommend, as I would I would recommend more a lifestyle, looking at the looking at lifestyle by itself. And so with this, Daniel Fast is a great example because what they've done is they've removed a lot of stuff out of the diet that can be that can be pro-inflammatory, cause more inflammation. And so what we want to do is we want to enhance the amount of fiber we're taking in per day and lowering the amount of High sugar, uh, high sugar foods, high salt foods, processed foods, um, and also diets that are very popular, such as high protein diet, that kind of stuff. When we do this, then we have all of the components that are in the plants, not just the fiber itself, that can aid in that situation. Does that make sense? So it's more of a lifestyle factor as opposed to just a certain one, because I can't say one particular, one particular uh, food, because again, like we talked about, is the, the different classes of bacteria, they feed on different types of fibers that are in the different foods. Does that make sense? So just kind of a whole global change in regards to it's a lifestyle change. And I think that's, I think that if you have more questions, I know that some of you are really wanting to go, and that's great, uh, but if you've got more questions, I'll be glad to uh, uh, answer them down here after they've kind of closed uh, for the evening.
So thank you again so much. I appreciate it. And I'll see you guys back on uh, Thursday. We've got another time. Yes. We'll see you Thursday evening. Let's all stand. I'm going to have a closing prayer tonight. Lord, you know each of us intimately. You know our needs better than we do or better than a doctor knows them. So we entrust our care ultimately to your keeping and may we cooperate with you. We thank you for what we've heard this evening. Pray, Lord, for healing of all within my hearing who have issues with their health. And Lord, uh, continue to heal Sharon, my wife. And keep us safe. Bring us back Thursday evening. In Christ's name.